So before we begin, I just want to go ahead and talk about uh, apprenticeship since we're going to hear it a lot when it comes to the uh, main character of today's video. Um, so an apprenticeship, it says here in Merriam-Webster's uh, dictionary, says here a position as an apprentice, an arrangement in which someone learns an art, trade or job under another. All right. Does that sound like slavery to you right away? He can obtain an apprenticeship with a carpenter. And it's synonymous with externship, internship, practicum, and training. So like learning, right? Hands-on experience. So does this sound like slavery? I'm on the website online etymology dictionary. And as a noun, it says here, apprentice. One bound by legal agreement to an employer to learn a craft or trade to learn to learn a craft or trade it's from 1300s from old french apprenti someone learning learning from french apprenti taking the older form as a plural also as an adjective unskilled inexperienced from apprendre to learn to teach all right modern french apprendre contracted from line apprendre take hold of or grasp mentally or physically in medieval land to learn so again someone learning apprenticeship all right so real quick i want to read from this i've read from this a lot before a lot of great info coming out of this article right here very scholarly it's called the illegal beginning of american negro slavery by william j wood this is from the american bar association journal volume 56 number one from january 1970 pages 45 to 49 we're just going to go to a specific part of this article it's going to corroborate with what I'm trying to show uh, here when it comes to apprenticeships. It's going to point out something very significant, again, that we overlook when we're reading uh, these so-called slave stories or narratives, all right, about apprenticeship. So we're like on page two of this article. We're jumping right into this paragraph, and it says here, and remember, again, this is from the American Bar Association Journal. We were in 1970. It says, nevertheless, those first black arrivals at Jamestown were not enslaved immediately. The first black, they're talking about those first 20-odd so-called Negroes that came in in 1619. They were not enslaved immediately. Rather, they were assimilated. They were what? Assimilated into that singular institution known as indentured servitude. Remember, it was a slavery. We've gone over this in past videos. Check it out. We've seen the progress of how they made indentured servitude into chattel slavery to, uh, for a lot of people, uh, getting trapped in these indentures uh, for life. And now again, it says here that indentured servitude for a term of years improvised by the Virginia Company from the child labor laws of Elizabethan England. All right. So we're going to know what the Elizabethan uh, laws were. And a part of it is going to talk about uh, this right here. It says the Elizabethan period was hard on the poor in England with islers everywhere. It was generally thought that the cure-all for poverty was work forced labor if necessary. In this situation, 1562, 45 years before the founding of Jamestown, Parliament borrowed from the guild system in London, where it was customary for youngsters to be apprenticed, all right? Youngsters to be apprenticed to a craftsman to learn a trade under an indenture between the craftsman and the parents for a term of years, all right? So that your own parents, the child's own parents would apprentice their children to a master, right? As an indenture for a term of years, as an indenture, remember 
The Statute of Apprentices from 1562 declared in part every householder exercising any occupation may retain the son of any free man not occupying husbandry nor being a laborer to be bound as an apprentice for seven years at the least so as the term do not expire a for such apprentice shall be. This statute surely acclimated Englishmen to the concept of bonded servitude. All right, so parents, most parents had to involuntarily or voluntarily apprentice their own kid for a number of years. Now, is that slavery? They're learning a craft, right? They're learning something for a number of years. I mean, this article now says Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University, scholarly comments at Hofstra Law. Hofstra Law Faculty Scholarship says Summer 1997, Transforming Childhood Apprenticeship in American Law by Janet L. Dolgan, Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. Now, the article speaks again about how the poor were, were being told, you know, they had to apprentice their kids and everything. And then the other one, it's in its heyday, it says here, it had functioned far less quizzically. Most colonial parents apprenticed their children soon after infancy ended generally between the ages of 7 and 14 to learn a trade and to be educated at least minimally in the home of a master. Master-apprentice relationships were usually the product of contractual negotiations that led to written agreements between a child's parent, all right, a child's parent, generally the father and master, agreements that today would be labeled immoral and proffered as evidence necessitating neglect or even abuse proceedings. All right, so in its heyday, again, most colonial parents apprenticed their children. It was happening on a wide scale. So was it always slavery? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Or was it always a white master giving up his bastard child into slavery? No. Continuing in this article says 15th century accounts of English families written by an Italian asserts that the entire system of apprenticeship reflects the unaffectionate relations that pertain between English parents and their children. This is the want of affection and the English is strongly manifested toward their children for after having kept them at home till they arrive at the age of seven or nine years of the utmost, they put them out both males and females, to hard service in the houses of other people, binding them generally for another seven or nine years, and these are called apprentices. And during that time, they perform all the most menial offices, and few are born who are exempted from this fate, for everyone, however rich he may be, sends away his children into the houses of others, while he in return receives those of strangers, not of his own. So they're saying even if you had a lot of money, the parents would still do that just because that was the normal thing. It's like sending off your kid to college. It was the way they got their craft or trade. They guaranteed them having a job. They was required to a lot of people to have this apprenticeship uh, years behind them to get a, a job, you know, a profession. And so these indentures were called apprentices, right? And just to correlate again, I'm in this other article. It says the International Journal of Children Kluwer Academic Publishers, uh, Master and Servants, the American Colonial Model of Child Custody and Control, Marianne Mason, University of California, Berkeley. Now I'm going to read right here. It says, while most children were not forcibly imported to the new world without parents, separation from parents and forced labor were common in all the colonies. Children were critical to the colonial labor force, all right, separation from parents. After the age of 10, children were often employed like adult workers, and many, if not most, did not remain in the custody of either parent until adulthood. While some came without parents, many others lost both parents through death or abandonment. Now, see, look at this, it says parents very often apprenticed or sent out their children to serve another family at around age 10 parents did it to their own kids parents why is this important Creamer? we'll see when we're talking about william ellison so apprenticeship was a big thing and the children's own parents was doing it very often it was happening all right and just real quick i'm reading from this book children bound to labor the popular apprentice system in early america by ruth wallace hernan and johnny murray 
All right, we're going to go inside of this book. And here's the cover again, Children Bound to Labor. I'm going to read from this part. It's chapter one, A Proper and Instructive Education, Raising Children in Proper Apprenticeship. Ruth Wallace Hurston, again, Johnny Murray. And it says here, right on page five, says apprenticeship was used broadly. All right. It was used very broadly. Apprenticeship in parentheses, right? We're going to keep, we're going to hear it when it comes to William Ellison. Was used broadly to refer to both poor children and those whose parents had bound them voluntarily to learn a trade. The parents, they wanted their son, their children, their children to learn a trade. And the term meant very different things in different times and places. It wasn't always the same everywhere. In Boston, children bound out by the overseers of the poor were un uniformly labeled apprentices. But in Connecticut, the term was seldom used by selectmen doing the bi bi binding. In New Netherland, apprenticeships provided vocational training in contrast to indentures for service. Although servant was applied to many of the bound children, it can hardly cover the case of those bound out by their parents to learn crafts and trades. And in some locations, magistrates avoiding calling poor children servants, even though their indentures bound them to menial servitude. All right. It wasn't the same, especially when it came to deal with the parents sending them under to these apprentices. It's not the same. So remember that. All right. When it comes to William Ellison, I'm going to remind you again, it can hardly cover the case of those bound out by their parents to learn crafts and trades, to learn crafts and trades by their parents. All right, so I think you guys got the point um, about what I'm trying to say. Apprenticeship was um, often is tried to use when it comes to slave times if it's a person of color. Uh, just to fit the narrative that he was a slave. But a lot of the times it was the actual parents just doing that because it was a common thing, like sending your kid to college so they can get a trade, so they can learn something, gain some experience. And when they get older, pro possibly get into the family business that they have or may not have, or they can have other opportunities, right? All right, so now before I get into, again, William Ellison, um, I want to point something out that I've mentioned a lot. And, and, and past videos make sure to if you're new to go back and I uh, and try to go three to two years back you'll see there's a lot of good information that we've gone over uh, to get to these uh, conclusions that we're in now to that all the correlation all the proof all the re historical records all right so again this one right here it's just to remind you guys because this is what we're going to be talking about now this is the book free negro owners of slaves in the united states in 1830 together with absentee ownership of slaves in the United States in 1830, compiled under the direction and edited by Carter G. Woodson, editor of the Journal of Negro History, Carter G. Woodson, all right? Washington, D.C., the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Again, yes, free Negro owners of slaves. Hey, what? What are they saying? Yeah, black masters, basically, right? People of color being slave owners. This is a whole census list from 1830. And I have the 1850 book too as well. All right. So just want to show you something that he mentions in this book in the introduction. All right. So again, we're in the introduction uh, of the book. And just want to go to this third paragraph real quick right here. Just so I can. Uh, it makes a real good point that we always forget, but we like to use when we try to explain why they would be black slave owners, right? But this is not the only reason, but this was one of the, one of the reasons, not the majority. It says the census records show that the majority of the Negro owners of slaves were such from the point of view of philanthropy. In many instances, the husband purchased the wife or vice versa, the wife purchased the husband. So again, what happened? So a husband purchasing a wife, right? That's family. The slaves belonging to such families were few compared with the large number found among the whites on the well-developed plantations. Dodge the hijack because he's going off a African slave narrative. Slaves of Negroes were in some cases the children of a free father who had purchased his wife. All right? If he did not 
thereafter emancipate the mother, as so many such husbands failed to do, his own children were born his slaves and were thus reported by the enumerators. All right. His own children were being considered what or called slaves. Why? Because he had to purchase his wife and he couldn't free them or emancipate them. There was a law against it. So he would just be the official owner, even though that's just the dad. All right. He made sure they wouldn't get sold off to anybody else, but they were still being treated as property sometimes because of that and they, he could lose them if he loses the legal battle for something but at least he can guarantee that they wouldn't be sold off again because he owned them until they can find manumission but again fathers owning mothers right fathers owning children mothers owning their children it happened a lot so when we talk about William Ellison's story remember this I'm going to point this out again alright so remember we're in the uh, free Negro owners of slaves in the United States, uh, 18, 1830 census, and we're on page 31. We just read the intro right there. We just I just wanted to show you. Uh, we're in the South Carolina section, South Carolina. And down here we have in Sumter County. I'm going to show the census that he we have the correct person, William Ellison. Says he has four and 12 total slaves. All right, 12 total slaves. William Ellison person of color that owned slaves the main character in our video today mr william ellison i right, real quick just wanted to show you this uh, website so you can see this is official history south carolina plantations.com or south carolina plantations.com is listing a lot of the famous plantations in south carolina this is in the uh, sumter county all right we just saw him living in sumter county right william ellison on the census there 1830 Free heads of families, a person of color. And right here we have the Ellison Plantation. As you can see, also called the Miller House Wisdom Hall. And this is the uh, Ellison Plantation in Sumter County. This is a picture of the modern house today, as it looks. Again, in South Carolina, also known as Ellison Plantation for owner William Ellison. All right, it says, let's just get a little of the history right here. We're going to touch the hijack because we're going to get all of all the info. We're going to break it down ourselves. It says, 1838, William, birth name, April Ellison, a free African-American purchased the 54.5 acre plantation known as Wisdom Hall at this time from Stephen Miller. The plantation adjoined property Ellison had previously purchased from Thomas Sumter. He continued growing cotton and made cotton gins with the labor of slaves, right? William had slaves. He was what? A so-called African-American. Now, it says here, Ellison was mulatto and born into slavery. At the age of 12, Ellison began an apprenticeship. Remember what I told you about apprenticeship? Oh, so now they want to say he's a slave because he was doing an apprenticeship, right? With a cotton gin maker and became highly skilled. He got really good at it. Ellison made repairs to cotton jeans at plantations and the early earning tips and some wages for his work. By 1816, he had earned enough money to buy his freedom. And in 1817, he purchased and freed his wife, Matilda and daughter Eliza Ann. So he bought his family. The Ellisons had three sons born in freedom. All right, Ellison set up the first cotton gin manufacturing shop in South Carolina and the Ellison gin was used across the South. All right, he was very popular with this gin. He had one of the biggest, or if not the biggest, cotton plantation William Ellison again in the Ellison plantation it said he was an apprentice and he was born a slave are we gonna look into that is this all conjecture the slavery part we know he was an apprentice is mentioned a lot we're in this other website it's called the history engine.richmond.edu all right and it says black owning blacks the story of William Ellison this is from 1857, Sumter County, economic inequality, the free blacks raised from slavery, human trafficking just into the University of Richmond. It says down here that by 1850, Ellison had 37 slaves while his son owned another 16. He was one of about 180 black slave masters in South Carolina. He was just one of 180 at that time in South Carolina, most of whom were former slaves themselves. Most were former slaves or oh, really that mean they were African black slaves? Could they have been maybe European indentured servants as well? Possibly American Indian indentured servants? All of the above. And so we'd have to look at every case individually to see who these people were and why they were slaves. 
That could mean they were indentured servants from Europe or Indian indentured servants. Uh, either way, we know they weren't going to Africa to grab these people. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of the sources here and the sources they're using. And this Richmond University is Michael P. Johnson and Lames L. Rourke, Black Masters, which we're going to read. This is the actual only real official uh, source they kind of use other than census stuff. William Ellison to Henry Ellison, that's the letter they were just talking about. And we got also the Ellison papers, we can verify that. Uh, also, 1850 slave census schedule, South Carolina Department of Archives and History. We're going to take a look at that. We have that. All right, so we got all these sources. I just want you to see that I'm going to be using the same sources that academia tries to show you. But we're going to break it down with our research, what we've been learning the last couple of years, right? All right, so before we continue, just wanted to show this great interview uh, from this channel, Ray Roman. Uh, this was filmed by Ray Roman, an interview by David Cano. All right, so all credit to them for this work. I'm not going to show everything. Again, fair use. Just want to show the great uh, interview and just part of it in the beginning that correlates to what we're talking about in my video today. So again, if you like uh, the video, go ahead and like it and subscribe if you like his content. I uh, just want to play a part of this video. Listen to what she's going to say about her family history so you can know this is actual real stories. All right. So here we go. Hi, Granny. How you doing? Oh, hi. How are you today? I'm doing good. Can you... Uh... I've always known you as Granny. What, can you say your full name and, and how to spell it as well, please? My full name is Christine. Uh, Christine Garner. And and where where were uh, first? Where were you born? I was born in Ringo, Louisiana. Ringo, Louisiana, and is that near New Orleans? No, yeah, no, yes, yeah, quite away from New Orleans. Okay, and do you know where your parents were born? Uh, hey, fun. Do you know where your parents were born? They were born in Ringo, Louisiana. What did they do for uh, for a living? Oh, they worked on a farm. They had they raised cotton, corn, peas, potatoes, all things like that. What we had to eat, we mostly had to raise it. Do you remember um, living on the farm? Well, sure, I remember living on the farm. Do you remember your your grandparents? Yes, I remember uh, my my grandfather. I don't remember my grandmother. Uh, what do you remember his name? William Gibson. And what was it? What did he do? He's a farmer too on a plantation. So do they own their own? Their own. He owned his own plantation, his own own place. He lived on, and that's where he did his work from, like planting different things for the have to survive. But yeah, I just remember him being a hardworking man, you know, raising his family and make sure that. You know, everything went well on the plantation. And he, he raised the same thing, peas and... Oh, peas, corns and potatoes. Cotton. Cotton. Mm-hmm. Peas. Everything mostly we ate, we raised it. Uh, was there any livestock as well, or was it just uh, things but, that you grew? Beg pardon? Was there any livestock? Was there any cows as well? Oh, or? yeah, he owned cows and horses. He owned all of that. All right, so I just wanted to basically show you this, that this is a real story. Just letting you know, she was raised on a farm. Her parents were farming. They were living off the land. And she remembers that her great, that her grandfather, you know, owned a plantation. It was his plantation. He didn't work for nobody. He wasn't a slave. He owned the plantation. She let you know straight up that he owned the plantation, a person of color, right? In Louisiana, you're going to find many instances of this in louisiana and doing genealogy with a lot of people we found this to be very true and not just in louisiana but all over the u.s all right real quick i uh, just wanted to show you this book as well uh to correlate this is a great book this is just references for you to you know if you want to pursue any further uh, research this is another great book aristocrats of color the black elite 1880 to 1920 let me just get to a better page here there we go. Aristocrats of Color, The Black Elite, 1880-1920 by Willard B. Gatewood, Indiana, Indiana University Press, Bloomington, and Indianapolis. All right. All right. And page 80 of this book, I want to talk about this part. And it talks about Charleston, South Carolina. We've mentioned this in my, my video that I did about the free people of color in South Carolina. If you haven't watched that video, make sure to go watch that very good uh, video. 
regarding I also, you know, the Huguenots and who was coming to the Carolinas and what was going on there, how it was one of the biggest Indian exportation uh, states or even just of slaves itself, uh, one of the biggest states that exported people out of there, all right, South Carolina. Now it says among black Americans, the aristocrats of color in Charleston, South Carolina, more than those anywhere else in the South, even in New Orleans, all right? There was more people there, of, of free people of color who were, you know, very uh, in this aristocrat class, had a reputation for snobbery and colophobia, colorphobia that persisted well into the 20th century. Both black and white observers trace the origins of Charleston's black elite to the top stratum of the city's sizable community of free people of color in the antebellum era who lived in self-satisfied complacency in a little world below the whites and above the slaves. That some of these free families of color were also slave owners. They were also what? Slave owners, all right? Again, more correlation. They were slave owners, made it all the easier for them to assume the outlook and values of whites in the post-war era. So the argument ran that descendants of the relatively well-to-do slaveholding free people of color perpetuated what has been termed the aristocratic complex of their forebears. In 1907, it continues here, the Charleston News and Courier in a feature story of the city's antebellum free black families of prominence maintained that their descendants are still the colored aristocracy of Charleston, nor was it affluence confined to that city's descendants of the Westons, Holloways, McKinley's, and the Reeves who settled elsewhere took with them the class consciousness and tone and flavor of unconscious refinement bequeathed by their forebears. All right, so you see all these fam families, prominent aristocrats, slave owning families of South Carolina. All right, so again, I just wanted to show you that this is a reality. As many books that can cover these topics, a little part of history they left out. They didn't teach us when we were growing up in school. They didn't really want us to think about aristocrats of color or so-called black masters or so-called or so-called black slave owners. All right. All right. So I just want to go ahead and read, also show you and read from this book a little bit. Uh, it's called No Chariot Let Down, Charleston's Free People of Color on the Eve of the Civil War. Edited by Michael P. Johnson and James L. Rourke. All right. And right away in this book, they're talking about, again, William Ellison, uh, his family letters. It says, comprise the only extent collection of sustained correspondences of a free Negro family in the late antebellum South. It says he was born a slave in 1790. William Ellison obtained his freedom in 1816 and established a cotton gin business. All right, he all of a sudden got a cotton gin business. By the time of his death, 1861, he owned 63 slaves and was the wealthiest free person of color in South Carolina. Most of the letters collected here were written by Ellison's son-in-law, James Marsh, Marsh Johnson. In the months between Harper's Ferry and the fire in Fort Sumter, the early letters document the calm confidence with which Charleston's leading mulatto families confronted the harassment and repression of free Negroes that accompanied the deepening sectional crisis. They describe routines of work and family life that bear close resemblance to those of their white contemporaries. And now those other people really white, participating in revivals and May festivals, attending lavish weddings and receptions, observing courtships, savoring gossip about petty scandals and traveling freely within beyond the state you see free they traveled they were treated just like white people they're telling you they live just like them and real quick right here in the introduction of the book see an original letter right here primary source and let me just read this part right here it says the letters are the correspondence of the extraordinary ellison family the patriarch of the family, William Ellison, was born a slave in 1790, but by the time of the Civil War, he was the wealthiest free Negro in South Carolina and owned more slaves than any other free Negro in the entire South, except Louisiana. All right, Louisiana, very prominent uh, free people of color, uh, slave-owning families. All right, in 1816, Ellison bought his freedom from his white master, Dodge the hijack, who may have been his father. Whoa, in parentheses, right? Now, all of a sudden, it may have been his father, actually. So he bought, hey, dad, here, I'm going to buy my freedom. Here's the money. Why would he have to pay his dad money to buy his freedom? 
who may have been his father. All right, because you're thinking he's a white master, right? And you're thinking, oh, he had, he raped, must have raped his slave, uh, slave, right? That's conjecture. We're gonna see what I'm talking about again. Who may have been his father? They don't know. They don't know, right? Or they're letting you know subliminally. All right. So all of a sudden, it was his own father who had him on so-called slavery. It was his own father. All right, his own father. What did we just learn earlier? About apprenticeship and about fathers having to own their children and why they did it. All right, let's be logical. And immediately moved from Fairfield District to Stateburg, a tiny aristocratic village about 40 miles away in the high hills of the Santee. So he got his freedom and he moved his gin business in one of the most aristocratic villages, actually. It was actually the most. You gotta read into it. Some 100 miles inland from Charleston. All right, so very close to Charleston, but, you know, in the suburbs, Ellison set up businesses as a cotton gin maker, a trade he had learned as a slave. Oh, he learned that as a slave, so they taught a slave how to do cotton and read and all that, right? They taught a slave. Oh, we'll see what they actually call it later on. Remember what they <laughs> what I'm talking about. Surrounded by the great planters and plantations of Sumter and adjoining districts, Ellison's gin business grew with the cotton boom until by 1835. Cotton plantation. A black owner. So-called black. He was prosperous enough to purchase the home of Stephen D. Miller, the former governor of the state. Ellison lived in the house until his death in 1861. By then, although he remained a gin maker, he had himself become a big planter making a hundred bales of cotton with 63 slaves on over 800 acres of land. All right. Ellison's house, which still stands, remained in the family until 1920. And it was under this house 15 years later that the Leffel Man girls discovered the letters. All right. So these are the famous letters. We basically wouldn't know anything about William Ellison, I believe, before that. It wasn't even known if he was a colored man. So if it wasn't for them finding these letters, they would have just assumed, again, like everybody else that was a, a so-called slave owner, that he was white. But because of the letters, it proves that he was a person of color. It says the Ellison family letters are unique. They are the only extant collection of a sustained correspondence between members of a free Afro-American family in the latter antebellum South. All the letters were written by free persons of color to free persons of color. James Marsh Johnson, William Ellison's son-in-law, wrote most of the letters, although letters from several other correspondents are sprinkled throughout the collection. Nearly all the letters were addressed to William Ellison's eldest son, Henry. He lived in the family compound in Stateburg with his father, his sister Eliza Ann, James and Johnson's wife, his two brothers, William Jr. and Reuben, and the senior Ellison's, several grandchildren. All right. So we got the census. We're going to see all these people in the census uh, genealogical site on ancestry. We're going to see that soon. And all there are 37 complete letters in the correspondence. Six are scattered between 1848 and 1858. 26 were written between November 1859 and December 1860. Two were written during the Civil War and three others were written afterwards. It is a commentary on the circumstances of the rest of the quarter of a million free Afro-Americans in the late antebellum South, on the vagaries of time, and on the long history of interracial suspicion, tension, and conflict that a meager 37 letter to one free Negro family are the most to appear in the last century and a quarter. All right, so these letters are the ones they try to pull out the story from, and uh, you know it doesn't say too much specifics about his childhood, all right, so that or anything like that is conjecture. That's why they don't know. That's why they say may have been his father earlier. We're going to continue to see that as we go on. All right, so this is a, a great source uh, for the actual letters because they have the uh, letters actually printed in this book. Again, this is No Cherry Let Down, Charleston's Free People of Color on the Eve of the Civil War. All right, and it starts out, this is just an example to Messrs. H. and R. Ellison, dear friends, I have just taken up my pen to inform you that the property of the state of T.S. Bonnie Esquire is to be sold on the next Thursday, and so on and so on. All right, to Henry Ellison was this written. 
So again, you can find these letters in here, the transcript of the letters, and we're going to keep moving. This is the Burrow House, a plantation home in Tiny Stateburg, South Carolina, about 10 miles west of Sumter. It has been the site of many Forrest Gump-like moments. General Thomas Sumter lived here, former Governor Stephen Miller lived here, Joel Poinsett, for whom the Poinsettia is named, died here, even Samuel Maverick, whose son became the namesake for the term Independent Rebel, owned this house on the property. A lot of really important but not splashy historic people have wandered through here. Perhaps the quietest of them all has arguably the most important story to tell. It began here in 1935 when three young girls discovered a stack of letters while playing in the basement of this home. Those letters, now held at USC's Carolinaana Library, tell the story of a slave named April. There's been a really good job of whitewashing. There's been a really good job of whitewashing. There's been a really good job of whitewashing. A very awkward discussion. It's a hugely awkward discussion. In 1802, a white plantation owner named William Ellison lent one of his young slaves, April, to work for a gin maker in Winsboro. April quickly became the go-to man for repairing the expensive cotton gins throughout the Sumter area. They send him out to the plantations and they take them apart. He would sharpen them on location. And that's why he heard about Stateburg. He came through here as a young man. You know, he said, well, he bought his freedom or whatever, and he came here. The center of plantation country, the wealthiest area of South Carolina. He changed his name. April was now known as William Ellison, the name of his former white owner. His gin business prospered. He bought this home, hundreds of acres of land, and eventually 68 slaves to work that land. Granger McCoy now lives in the Ellison home and says he often finds old cotton gin blades. What did the Ellison say when they come? They looking for the home place. All descendants of what many of us thought an impossible oxymoron, a black slave owner, a black slave owner, a black slave owner. I had a black ophthalmologist come through here, Ellison, and we sat on this couch right here. And his great great granddaddy owned 68 slaves. And here I am, white over here, and my great great granddaddy didn't own any slaves. And it, it was like a, uh, somebody blew a dog whistle in a kennel if I was just kind of turning the head, not knowing how to handle all this. History tumbles here. And what little we can learn about Ellison as a slave owner isn't pretty. The book Black Masters chronicles Ellison's life in the antebellum South and suggests that his slaves were the worst fed and clothed of any in Stateburg. It also suggests that Ellison was a slave breeder, selling off infant girls, a practice even some white owners found cruel. Whatever the case, Ellison certainly had a good relationship with other white aristocracy. This contract shows that Ellison didn't just buy a home in wealthy Stateburg, he bought it directly from former Governor Stephen Miller a governor and former slave trading property. He was the wealthiest black man in South Carolina, the fourth wealthiest in the South, wealthier than more than 90% of whites. Just a few hundred yards from the Ellison home is the Ellison graveyard, private, neither mixed with other white nor black tombstones, symbolic of his unusual position in the pre-war South, a position so few of us even knew existed. Whatever happened during Reconstruction, and then up through the Jim Crow era, anything and everything that had to deal with the relationships between the blacks and the whites just went underground. Anything and everything that had to deal with the relationships between the blacks and the whites just went underground. And may have remained so, if not for a stack of letters found under his house. All right, so before we continue, just wanted to also talk about conjecture, right? Uh, I might say that is conjecture a lot, past videos or when I'm live somewhere. Just want to make sure you guys know what conjecture is, right? Before we read William Ellison's story. We've already said, right? Before they said possibly it could be his father, possibly. That means they're guessing, right? They don't know. Definition of conjecture. Inference formed without proof or sufficient evidence conjecture a conclusion deduced by surmise or guesswork they're guessing conjecture conjecture as a verb to arrive or deduce by surmise or guesswork guess 
So ideas or opinions formed without proof or sufficient evidence. And we're in online etymology dictionary now. Conjecture says conjecture is a noun. It says interpretation of signs. Dreams are omens. Also supposing. You supposing a surmising from old French conjecture surmise or guess. Get taking a guess, conjecture, or directly from the Latin conjectura, conclusion, interpretation, guess, inference, literally a casting together of facts, etc., from conjectus, past particle of conicere, to throw together, from a simulated form of calm, together, a sense of unverified supposition. It's from 1520s, that of act of forming of opinion without proof. Is from 1530s, an opinion without proof conjecture. All right. All right. So we're going to get this video now uh, from this channel uh, named Parish Halsell. This is this uh, brother's uh, video. So fair use. This is his work. I didn't do this. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I think it was a great information just to correlate what we're showing today. So you can see it's not just me doing this research and letting people know. All right. Just get a little bit. Uh, from this video, you can watch the rest on your own. Just correlation again. Listen to what he's going to say. Hit like and subscribe if you like the channel. In this letter dated March 26, 1857, William Ellison wrote to his son Henry, who was clearly involved in handling the accounts of the ginning business. By the time of this letter, William Ellison and his family were a part of an elite group of free African Americans based largely in Charleston. Ellison maintained his wealth and financial security by purchasing land and slaves. By 1860, Ellison owned over 900 acres of land, as well as 63 slaves. According to the census of 1860, Ellison was one of 171 black slaveholders in South Carolina. His home in Stateburg, which had been previously belonged to former governor Stephen Miller, still stands today. These letters come from the Ellison family papers, which consist of letters, notices, receipts, and accounts for William Ellison. These papers are unique since they are perhaps the only sustained collection of papers between members of a family of free African Americans during slavery time. All right, so I just wanted to go ahead and uh, stop it right there. Again, you can catch the rest on your own, but uh, just more correlation, uh, he's letting you know very interesting point here just hope you guys heard that all right that in 1860 he was just one of 171 so-called black slave owners in charlestown south carolina all right so just trying to make sense out of all this and uh trying to verify the history and the genealogy of these people you know how i am um, what I decided to do is uh, look for William Ellison's uh, descendants, the closest ones, I guess, uh, to our modern time. I didn't want to go too far in. I guess, you know, that stuff is private. Start out with here with Amelia Bell Ellison, born 1920, passed on 2009. Rest in peace. And when you go into Amelia Bell Ellison, it says she's from North Carolina, ended up in Ohio, and I got a couple of census. Uh, and facts here and this is what I want to show you guys how we determine things on uh, genealogy websites especially this one on ancestry how I usually do it so you guys can see how I get to my conclusions all right so that's her picture right there I don't know who's that next to her I want to go into uh, it says that her parents are Henry Shrewsbury Ellison and Margaret Maggie Bell Rogers all right how do we prove that we got a couple facts here linked to her one of them is this one, the 1930 states uh, census. Let's go into that. All right. And this is the 1930 United States federal census for Amelia Ellison. And this is the, her family right here. We zoom in. Amelia's right here as the daughter of Henry Ellison and Margaret. Right. We just saw her as the parents. So we can verify that. And it gives us some facts. Uh, color, right? Negro over here. Negro. Um, place of birth of the person and the father and the mother tells you what states the father and the mother are from all right so south carolina south carolina and the mother north carolina north carolina all right so from amelia again we get henry shrewsbury ellison and margaret uh as uh margaret bell rogers okay let's go into henry real quick this is a close-up of henry 
All right. So you can see Henry Shrewsbury Ellison. And this is a close up of his wife, uh, Margaret Bell uh, Rogers Ellison. Now, back to Henry, uh, her husband. We got a couple of census here 1880, United States Federal Census, 1910, 1930. All right, and some other stuff, his death certificate. Let me just see this one real quick. And this is his actual death certificate. This is another way to verify uh, information. And again, I got the full name right here, Henry Ellison. It says full name. Color is colored, right? His spouse is Margaret Ellison, right? We already verified that. He was born April 13th, 1883, so we can verify that. And then it says his dad is Henry Ellison, also named Henry Ellison, and Amelia Shrewsbury. All right, the Shrewsbury, that's how he got his middle name, Henry Shrewsbury Ellison. All right, so his parents are listed here, so we can continue the line. His, again, his father, as you can see here on the side, father, Henry Ellison, mother, Amelia Shrewsbury, and his spouse, Margaret Ellison. So let's go back again to Henry Shrewsbury Ellison. And again, here, parents, Henry Ellison and Amelia Ann Shrewsbury Ellison. All right, so we continue. Now we get into 1817. Look at this. So again, from Henry Ellison and Margaret Bell, I mean, she has her own tree. We can follow that. Uh, just going up the Henry, the Ellison line again. We got Henry Ellison and Amelia Shrewsbury. All right, so now I just want to real quick show you. Um, when you start putting in information on these sites, it starts giving you hints. Like this one, right? Like you see these little green leaves? Those are hints. All right. I'm going to go into this one right here to Reuben Ellison just to show you. What these hints are and what they look like so it gives you ancestry maybe other trees that might have the same information and some other facts that might be related to the person you have on your tree so this one says uh it's south carolina's u.s wills and probate records courtland wills and, fin and financial records i guess of reuben ellison this one is an 1850 united states federal census and this one's an 1850 u.s federal census slave schedule and it says Reuben Ellison. You see how they spell it different, but it's actually the same person. You're going to find that a lot. See, these two are the same person, Reuben Ellison and Reuben Ellison. It's Sumter. And this last one says Reuben Ellison, birth 10 December 18. This is from uh, Find the Grave a website. I want to click on this one real quick so you can see. All right, and it brings us to this entry right here on Ancestry.com. Down here it says William Holmes Ellison. Holmes Ellison is the dad of Reuben. William Holmes Ellison. Remember who's the main character? William Ellison. And mother Matilda Ellison. Harriet Ann is the spouse it says here. So this is the actual link of the place. You can verify things like this as well. So you go to findagrave.com and they have his entry right here. And it says according now let's, let's this is when it starts getting interesting. All right, so let's just read what it says here. It says according to the book Black Masters, a free family of color in the old South, by Michael P. Johnson and James L. Rourke, Reuben is the only member of the Ellison family buried in the cemetery without a marker. All right, so we're talking about Black Masters. He was the son of William April Ellison. See how he put April in parentheses. Ellison, a former slave and free black man. Reuben's paternal grandfather was the white slave owner of William, all right? Now, remember, we learned about conjecture, right? What was conjecture? We got to dodge the hijack. They're just saying this because they own slaves. They now know if he's white. There is no proof that these are white people. According to the Wikipedia page, right? Wikipedia is their source. Get what I'm saying? Wikipedia. According to the Wikipedia page for Reuben's father, Reuben was a free black person after his father purchased the freedom on Reuben, his mother, Matilda, and his brothers, all right? Now, it says here, according to Arthur Larry Coger and Black Slave Owners, we read this book in my South Carolina video. It says here that according to this guy, Larry Coger, the Ellison family were the only Black people to hold slaves in the Sumter District. Oh, really? I'm going to debunk that right now, all right? Because remember, we, we go to facts. So this is find a grave. You can see you can verify information either way. Let me show you what it says here. It says Reuben's dad, parents, right? 1790, remember this. It doesn't say nothing about April, right? Don't say April right here. It says William Holmes Ellison and Matilda Ellison, 1790 to 1861. So we are talking about William Ellison, the famous colored black slave owner, all right? It doesn't say nothing about April right here. So again, we know we're talking about the same people. 
So I'm going to hit yes. Does this match your record? Yes, it does. All right, they, they match it with what I have. See, same day, birth date. All right, it says boom. And this is the same dad as I, what I have. They had William Holmes Ellison the second. I had William Holmes April because they're always calling him April, right? In parentheses, just to make sure I get all the info. But you see, somebody else, that website, Find a Grave, has it as Holmes. Is that Holmes? All right. And then Matilda, the mom. Yes, it matches. Sometimes they have different dates. We hit save to your tree. So that hint was accepted. Now, we're going to go review this slave schedule, right? Reuben Ellison. We're going to click on it. All right. And we're going to zoom in. First of all, we're going to go to the top. So you guys can read what it says here, all right? So it says, Schedule 2, Slave Inhabitants in Sumter District, all right? Sumter District. Remember it said that Larry Cohen said they were the only black family that owned slaves in Sumter District, right? All right, let's we'll see if he's right. So right here we got Reuben Ellison, William Ellison Jr., and Henry Ellison. All right, Henry Ellison is the person we just read about. The ancestor of Amelia, the person we started out with in the street. And what are they? Let me go back to the top. All right, let's go to the top. Name of slave owners. Names of slave owners. Names of slave owners. These are slave owners, right? Color B, look, black. All right, so these are the slave. What, what, there's no name that's a slave. They're not even listing their name, they're just putting them as a number. All right, Henry Ellison, he's black. And over here on this side, you got William Ellison, the dad. All right, he's 50. He's a mulatto. It says here, mulatto. So all these people live in Sumter District. Who's this guy? He's not an Ellison. Is that an Ellison? H. Atrinson. He's B, right? He's black, slave owner. I'm going to go to the page after, before this. All right, let me just show you. We got J.M. Johnson. It says that he's actually... Black B, see Ditto, Ditto, Ditto. See all these double lines, Ditto. All these people are with dark skin or being called black. You got B, Mood or Hood. He's also so called black. That's in Sumter Dirt. These are slave owners. All right. Keep going. It says W.W. Anderson. He's listed as a mulatto color, right? Again, slave owner. Let's keep going before that. All right. Wow. The W.W. Anderson. It says here, let's see, Dado, Dado, Dado from what? From B. All these people are listed as black, even the slave owners. W.B.R. Minston Hill. It says here, Hester A. Dixon. All right. This Anderson has a lot of slaves. Look at all this line. All these are his. These are all his right here. So they're lying because look what it still says up here. Sumter District. Larry Cohen is lying. Sumter District. There's more black slave owner families. All right. M. Roofs or Roofs. Look at that. B. There's a lot of them. I could keep going. There's a lot. So I'm going to hit yes. This person does match. And I'm going to save to tree. All right. And this is the other type of hint. Ancestry member trees, meaning that there's other uh, trees that have the same info of your person. So it matches what you have with what they have. So the, the owner is my mom first. All right. It says William Holmes, April, Matilda, unknown. It says the last name is unknown, her maiden name. All right. So we hit check. And then the Bradford family tree has the same info. We hit check. All right, and the Romero family has the same info. Matilda, all right, those are his parents. And then, yeah, we check with the info we already got. Again, same way, Matilda. All right, these are the siblings. We don't got them. Eliza, we got her. We got Maria Ellison. We got Henry Ellison. We got the other William April Ellison the third. All right, they got a picture of him. And we got Mary Elizabeth, so we're gonna save those that we already had in our time tree. And that's all the hints for Ruben. We're gonna go back to the family tree again. So I just wanted to show you how you can uh, 
you know, work the hints. All right, so we're going to keep going up. Remember, we came from Amelia to Henry to the other Henry Sr. and his dad, William uh, Holmes April Ellison. A parenthesis April. So this is the so this is a famous William Ellison. So we're gonna read some of the stories that they have here on Ancestry regarding William Holmes April. All right, all right. So you'll find stories like this on uh, Ancestry. It says from slave to slave owner. Let me see if I can uh, zoom in. This was posted on um, 5th of July 2020 by CatKids71. It says, William Holmes April Ellison was born 1790 in Fairfield, South Carolina, which was 40 miles northwest of the High Hills to William Holmes Ellison and Mary Harrison. All right, so this person is saying that his dad is William Holmes Ellison and Mary Harrison. He married a woman named Matilda, and together they had the following children, Eliza Marie William Holmes III and Reuben Ellison. All right, Reuben, who was a slave owner, remember? He had an illegitimate child named Maria Ellison that he sold. April was a slave owner and one-time slave himself. It was told that he was hard on his slaves. And interestingly, none of his slaves were mulattoes. They were all black. When he was 26, he became a free man. And three years later, at the Sumter District Courthouse, he had his name changed to William. William was the name of his former master, William Holmes Ellison I. He changed his name from April because it was tied to slavery. He was known for being a cotton gin maker. In 1822, he built his cotton gin shop on an acre of land that he purchased for $375 from General Thomas Sumter. This shop would be operated by William and his grandsons for many decades. The shop is located northwest of the corner of busy intersection at the roads of Charleston, Camden, and Sum Sumterville, Columbia, South Carolina. Now at the Holy Cross Episcopal Church, where he attends services, William rose in respectability. His family became so respected that they were the only colored family allowed to worship on the main floor. William Ellison was permitted to place a bench under the organ loft for the use of himself and family. William Ellison died on December 5, 1861 in Statesburg, South Carolina, and was buried with his wife, Matilda. His tombstone was placed in the first row of the family's graveyard. All right, so we got to dodge a lot of hijack in here, but it tells us a little drop here and there. But they're straight up listing him as the son of, again, William Holmes, Ellison, and Mary Harrison. All right, this is another story. It says here from slave to entrepreneur. All right, so it starts, starts talking about the historical background of cotton gin, all right, cotton plantations and how important it was. Down here regarding April Ellison, it says here, April born in 1790 to black slave parents. I right, remember the last story we just came from, say, it was William Holmes uh, Ellison and, and uh, the lady. Remember, we just came from that other story that said that uh, William Holmes Ellison and the other lady, Marianne Harrison, was his mom, right? Here it's saying black slave parents. And he was owned by William Ellison, a white slave owner, right? Conjecture, where's the proof? Often children of slaves were named for the month in which they were born. Around 1802, Ellison apprenticed April to William McCrady, gin maker in Winsboro, South Carolina. All right, so he got apprenticed. Remember what that means? That, that always means slavery. And were parents doing it to their with their children? Yes, they were, right? He was to be trained as a kind gin builder and repairer. Very little is known about April's life beyond his apprenticeship. Very little. They don't know much, but he said they have black slave parents, but he don't know nothing. The person writing this, you see what I'm saying? So what? Conjecture. Very little is known about April's life beyond his apprenticeship, except in 1811, he had a daughter by Matilda, a 16-year-old slave woman. All right. And what's the source? Johnson and Work. We're going to get into that book. April worked in McCraig's gin shop until 1816, learning how to be a blacksmith, a machinist, and a carpenter, skills required of a gin maker. In addition to learning to be a master gin builder, during his apprenticeship with McCraig, April learned to read, write, cipher, and do bookkeeping. Indeed, McCraig had provided April with all the skills, both intellectual and mechanical, necessary for independent success as a gin maker. Johnson and Roar. We're going to get into that book. April's long-term apprenticeship in gin making prepared him for freedom. Not only did he become a master gin builder, but also he learned how to get along with the white planners. Now they add in their conjecture. April aspired to be successful as a free black gin maker. He had to understand the ways of the whites. Oh, really? We just saw the other uh, census, right? Showing all those so-called black slave owners. Not just white people around in that same uh, county. All right. So again, he was prepared. He was given an apprenticeship. He was prepared 
to carry on a family business. Okay? Why was he being so prepared? All right. He had an apprenticeship. All right. So real quick, I want to bring you to this website. Uh, it's a website that comes up a lot when you're searching about William Ellison. It says the Ellison Family Graveyard here, Stateburg, Sumter County, South Carolina. All right. So this is the historical uh, cemetery, I guess, for the family. All right. And this is by uh, this person right here, Anita Martin, photographs by Gloria Lyles. All right, fair use. And uh, some more of the graveyard here. All right. And more right here. So I want to go down to what the information is because I want to read to you, uh, you know, their information on this website, you know. So it says here, William Ellison Jr. All right, Jr. They call him Jr. They're not saying he's a, a slave of William Ellison the same junior so there will be a William Ellison senior right now right here it says at birth William Ellison junior was given the name of April it was popular practice among the slaves of the period to name a child after the day of mom for his or her birth it is known that between the years 1800 and 1802 April was owned by a white slave owner named William Ellison all right conjecture son of Robert Ellison of Fairfield County in South Carolina it is not documented as to who his owner was before that time. They don't know, all right? Listen to that key word right there. So again, conjecture, right? It can only be assumed, it could only be assumed that William Ellison, a planter of the Fairfield District, was either the father, was either what? The father or the brother of William Ellison Jr. All right, you hear that? This website's telling you it can only be assumed because there's nobody owned. There's no record of him being owned. So we have to make assumptions, right? So if they're going to be making assumptions, who's to say their assumptions are right or wrong, right? So they're saying the father or the brother. They're actually saying that William is either William Holmes, the one who's supposed to be his owner, is actually his father or his brother, meaning he might be the son of Robert Ellison. Which is with the other William Ellison's father, all right? So he might actually be the son of Robert Ellison, and that might be his brother, all right? All of a sudden, he has his brother or father. Again, remember that. We read that earlier, too. So again, they don't know. And what happens? Conjecture happens. Freedman of Sumter County. April had his name changed to William Ellison by the courts, obviously, obviously, in honor of William Ellison of Fairfield, obviously, in honor of his dad, obviously, why is he saying obviously? Why would somebody name themselves after their slave master? I don't know, that don't make sense to me. At the age of 10, William April Ellison was apprenticed. He was apprenticed, again, by who? By his, and he was trained as a car engine builder and repair. He spent six years training as a blacksmith and carpenter, and he also learned how to read and write. All right, so we got the same story already. Since there are no records showing the purchase of April, all right, listen to this says there are no records showing the purchase of April later William Ellison of Sumter by William Ellison of Fairfield all right there's no proof that he bought that that he where he got William there's no proof where William Ellison if that was his slave where he got him from you know, there's no record of purchase or anything like that all right it is unknown as to how long April was owned by William Ellison it is known that William Ellison of Fairfield inherited a large estate from his father, Robert, and that the slaves of the estate named in the will were left to his siblings. It is possible that Robert Ellison gave several slaves to his son before his death, so they would not have needed to have been mentioned in his will. All right, so again, what's going on? They're assuming it's all conjecture. William owned several slaves according to the census records. Both Robert and William were of age to have been able to be the father of April. So now listen to what they're telling you. All of a sudden, he's not just a slave. He might be the son of either his grandfather or his dad, the owner, so supposed to be the white owner, right? Remember, he was just a white owner. And remember, he was, on, he was born to black parents. Now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he might be the son of the, I thought he was a white slave owner. And who's to say they were white? That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's all conjecture. April was trained as a machinist and he became a well-known cotton gin maker. Upon receiving his freedom, he decided to pursue his expertise in Sumter County, South Carolina, where he found an eager market for his trade. He is well-known for perfecting the cotton gin invented by Ely Whitney. He perfected it. 
So, all right, so back in the tree, we were back coming from Amelia all the way up to Henry and Henry, then William, Ellison, the famous April, right? The famous April. And I just want to show you, uh, this is in Waikiki Tree uh, website as well. And I found this and it's listen, April William Ellison, right? The son of William Holmes Ellison, right? The son of William Holmes Ellison. They're not saying he's a slave and mother unknown. They're saying unknown mother. I right, brother Isabella Williamson, William Harrison Ellison, half brother says. All right, so real quick back on ancestry.com for my entry on uh, April, right? So called April or the slip black slave on the famous William Ellison. All right, has his parents also listed as William Holmes Ellison and Marianne Harrison. All right, now I want you to pay attention to something. It tells you here that he was he died in uh, 1861. He was born in 1790, right? So he should have been alive but in 1850. And he's from Fairfield County. We found William Holmes Ellison in 1850, Fairfield County. Now first, let's go to his supposed dad or brother, right? William Holmes Ellison. Says he was born in 1775 and he died in 1833. Real quick, William Holmes Ellison, 1833. Waikiki tree has the same, right? Died in 1833, Fairfield, South Carolina. All right. Find a grave. Also has him dying in 1833. You see, the son of Robert Ellison and Sarah Elizabeth Potts. All right. 1833. His dad supposedly died, or his brother, at the age of 57. In 1833, he was only 57. In 1833. Jeannie also has him as uh, 1833. And most every other thing has them as listed as 1833. Main reason for that is because there's a probate supposed will. So this is the supposed uh, will and testament of uh, William Ellison. That he supposedly, it says probate date 1833. That's when he made this or wrote this. Because he actually wrote that in this letter that he's writing this on 1833. Alright, so that's not the year he died. So I haven't found a death record for him other than this probate. And that's what they're most of everybody that gets basin that he died in 1833. So let's say, okay, he did die in 1833. So we're going to go back to his supposed son or brother, William Holmes, the so-called slave, April, right? We have an 1850 U.S. federal census slave schedule from Fairfield County. We know that we're going to read. He's from Fairfield County. That's where William Ellison was at. And that's where he had his slaves. We got his federal uh, 1850 U.S. federal census slave schedule for William H. Ellison, right? H. Ellison. Wait a minute. I thought he was supposed to be dead in 1833. And wait, he's 80 here? Well, that would make him around 1770, 1775, the same year that the other Ellison that died in 1833 would be. So what's going on here? All right? So... As I can see, somebody don't know anything. A lot of people is doing a lot of con conjecture. All right, assuming making up things, we that's why we got to research this. Now, the other thing I want to show you again, William H. Ellison, black, right? Black, B, black. So if it is his dad, his dad was also black. If it is the real, uh, the other Holmes Ellison, now you see it's H, right? You don't see April, right? Because I thought he was the black slave. I thought he was the one that was black. You see all the trickery that's going on. Let me show you what says on the top right here. Slave inhabitants in the county of Fairfield, all right, state, South Carolina. All right, South Carolina. And again, William and all these other people. Let me just show you again. Name of slave owners. LaBeau, Chappelle, Black, Chappelle, Dave Chappelle, Chappelle, Labori, Chappelle, Black. Black, all right, Glacier, Bab, Black, so called Black, right? Robert, uh, what does this say? Slabon or slogan, all right, what does this say? Again, B, yep, B, he's also Black. All these people are people of color. I'm gonna go to the next page. Now, look at this, it got William H. Ellison, that would be his son, right? Harrison. William Harris Ellison, he's six here, and he's also colored. He's also black, B, all right? In 1850, take away a couple years, tell me he would be, what, born in 1844, yep, just like with the other William Harrison, right? So they got to explain all this. 
who is this will william ellison h ellison right living in 1850 with slaves supposed to be 80 if the other guy died in 1833 but this guy is colored again white trees put in april william ellison the son of william holmes ellison who was supposed to be born in 1775 and died in 1833 is it the same person is what i'm trying to tell you did he really change his name or is it the same person or what's going on here all right so i want to bring you to this book all right very good book right here found luckily on archive.org fair use it's, it's called black masters a free family of color in the old south by michael p johnson and james l rourke now remember this book is actually like the main source for um this person's story all right so i just wanted you to see the actual source and we're gonna you know read into this see what sources they have what are they telling us if this is the uh, main source right so it says in chapter one april story because on june 20 1820 april ellison appeared on the steps of the sumter district courthouse in sumterville south carolina he had left his home and tra traveled 12 miles east over dusty Ruddy Rhodes to present a petition to Judge William Henry de Saucer. April had a simple request. He wanted a new name. April Ellison, his lawyer, explained at the hearing, was a freed yellow man of about 29 years of age. Emancipated four years earlier, he had moved to Stateburg in Sumter District, where he was endeavoring to preserve a good character and gain a livelihood by honest industry in the trade of gin making. His name hampered these ambitions because april was recognizable to all as a slave name a change of names his lawyer argued although apparently unimportant would yet greatly advance his interests as a tradesman a new name would also save him his children from degradation and contempt which the minds of some do and will attach to the name of april because of the kindness of his former master william ellison and as a mark of gratitude and respect for him april asked to change his name to William. All right, so April. So they're saying there's a court. All right, we got a footnote here. We're going to verify that footnote. All right, so we're at the notes of the books. And uh, in chapter one, it says here that uh, footnote for one, that court record supposedly where he wanted to change his name was in the Court of Equity, Sumter District on June 20, 1820, miscellaneous records, book D, 369, S C D A H. So if you guys can help me with that. All right. See if anybody can find that, if there's an actual case like that. That would be interesting. Let's go back. Continue says, when he presented his petition, April Ellison lived on the western edge of Sumter District in or near Stateburg, in a tiny village perched in the high hills of the Santee, a narrow ridge of rolling hills along the east bank of the Watery River, renowned for beauty, a healthy climate, and fertile soils. The high hills attracted some of the earliest settlers of the Carolina back country. So he was in a good place. By the first decades of the 19th century, the hills were dense with cotton plantations, cotton planters and their slaves. In 1820, Afro-Americans, so-called Afro-Americans, made up nearly two thirds of Sumter District's total population of 25,000. All right. Is that true? But slaves numbered 16,343,000. While free Negroes like Ellison numbered only 382, all right, we'd have to verify that because we do know, again, they were labeling a lot of people of color white, and 10 years later, they will become black. We've shown this in Wanagi's family and his census, uh, his ancestors' census records. I've shown that in other ones too, all right? So we got to, we know there was Swarthy Europeans coming, a lot of people of color from Europe coming, so we got to touch the hijack. All right, it says, why did this free yellow man live in the aristocratic high hills? Why did he live with the aristocrats, right? Surrounded by wealthy white planters. Were they all wealthy white planters? Because we just saw the census in Sumter and everybody around there was so-called black. As with the vast majority of individuals born into slavery, nearly impenetrable curtain shrouds April's origins and early life. All right, he doesn't know. And impenetrable. He hasn't been able, this author is telling you straight up, he hasn't been able to penetrate the mysterious origins of April and his early life. His tombstone records that he was born in 1790, all right? His tombstone says 1790. Did somebody put that there? 
His birthplace was probably his owner's plantation about 40 miles northwest of the High Hills in Fairfield District. All right, so again, there is no birth records. There's no records of William buying April. It says that they found that on his tomb. Maybe somebody could have put 1790 on his tomb, carved it in, right? But is that, so that's what they're going off is basically what I'm letting you know. It says that the Hills is an aristocratic place where he moved into. This is a fertile upcountry region lying between the watery and broad rivers. Self-described as a yellow man, a contemporary term for a light-skinned mulatto, the yellow man. April was a mixed racial origins. Since he was a slave, we can be certain his mother was a slave since he belonged to a white man named Ellison. All right, so again, conjecture. We're going to see why. She probably did too. So she was probably his slave. Now, remember, we got in the beginning of this video that there were people buying out their wives, owning their children. All right. So was it always a slave, a white slave master raping a slave woman, a colored slave woman? It wasn't always like that. Is what I'm trying to explain to you. This whole story, it doesn't make sense when you start trying to put it together. All right? It makes more sense if you put in all the historical background behind it because this stuff was happening. It says white slave owners named Ellison lived in Fairfield District in 1790. But all that is known of their slaves is their number, making it impossible, impossible to determine if a slave woman who could have been April's mother was among them. It's impossible. They're making it up. It's all conjecture. You see what I'm trying to tell you? Conjecture. They are assuming. It is conjecture. They are assuming. Possibly purposely hiding something here. Because this was a man of color, the biggest plantation owner of South Carolina. Again, of her ancestry or even her name, we know nothing at all. They don't know anything at all. Now, in the notes, the source for number five is the 1790 census schedule in Fairfield District. So, real quick, this is what they're talking about. I wanted to show you. Um, it says here that this is the uh, head of families of the first census of the United States taken in the year 1790 this is an archive.org this is by the united states bureau of census all right and this is the book i just want to show you what he's saying about white about white ellison's living in fairfield county this is robert ellison all right this would be uh either ellison william ellison's uh dad or grandfather according to what they're telling us right they don't know so it says here that yeah he was a slave owner and again this is what they're calling free white males you know now, does that mean status? What does that mean? And I just label them as white here. When did this all start? They're telling you that there was uh, supposed, because it says they're white, uh, named Ellison, lived in Fairfield District, but all that is known of their slaves is that their number making it impossible to determine if it was a woman who could have been April's mother was among them. The identity of April's father is also obscure. All right, the identity of April's father is also obscure. They don't know. Again, this is the main source. This book we're reading right now, Black Mass, is one of the main sources for William Ellison's story. All right, and he's letting you know, this author, that his moms, they don't know. His dad, they don't really know. Its father's also obscure. Either a mulatto father or mother could account for April's light complexion. But more likely, April's father was a white man. Either William Ellison, oh, oh, either William Ellison. So all of a sudden, he's not from black parents, right? So William Ellison, but we already saw William H. Ellison was listed as black. He was almost 80 in 1850. So again, they're saying it's either William Ellison. His dad is either William Ellison, the planter who eventually freed him, or William Ellison's father, Robert Ellison. All right, they don't know. You hear what I'm saying? So what happens? They're doing conjecture. These are opinions. Because they don't know. So I'm trying to tell you. So what do we go off? If this is our source. When April was born in 1790. Robert Ellison owned 15 slaves. On a plantation situated. Two miles from Winsboro. So again they're grabbing the 1790 year. From the tombstone. Alright there's no birth record or anything else. The largest town in Fairfield district. A settlement of 50 or 60 houses. April's mother may have been. One of the slaves. May have been again conjecture assuming may have been conjecture robert elson was 48 years old in 1790 and his youngest child was not yet five his eldest william was about 17 both men lived on the plantation and had the biological cap capability to father a slave 
son. So to see what they're telling you right here, they're saying that William was 17, Robert was 40 something, 48, I believe he said. So they could have both been the dad, either of them. William was already 17, he could have done it. They're letting you know in this book, this main source, right? That that is their son. This is this, he's related to these people. He is an Ellison. He is an Ellison. All right, I'm letting you know right now, he is an Ellison. They're telling you right now. So again, anything else would be conjecture. So if we're going to conjecture, let's at least be logical, right? Let's be logical. He was apprenticed. He took on the family business. What happened to his other son? Why didn't he become a, a wealthy plantation owner like the so-called slave son? What happened to all the rest of the, the, the sons? Why only April became so famous? It says here, April Ellison's 1820s petition for a new name declared that William Ellison had owned him for many years years and had freed him again we know fathers owning their children that happened a lot that happened a lot but also we got to go into that court record to see if what it really says just when william ellison acquired april is not recorded they don't have no records of when he bought him if he really owned him that's his son or his brother but it was evidently between 1800 and 1806 why was it evidently in 1800 according to the census william ellison owned no slaves in 1800, he didn't have no slaves. Ten years later, he owned 19. Upon his father's death in 1806, William received a bequest of a substantial amount of property, but no slaves. William's younger brothers and sisters inherited the slaves their father owned at the time of his death. And because the will named each slave, we can be certain that April was not among them. He didn't give it to him. All right. William's generous inheritance of land suggests that he was in good standing with his father and thus may have been given some of his father's slaves before 1806. Probably April, probably, probably, they don't know, probably April and possibly his mother, possibly and probably again. What is that? Conjecture. More and more conjecture. I hope you guys are listening to what I'm showing, mean, or at least paying attention to what I'm showing you here, what's going on here, right? It's all conjecture. In 1800, Robert Ellison owned nine slaves. April could have been one of the 19 slaves. Could have been. He could have been. Could have been more conjecture. Of the 19 slaves, the census enumerated recorded for William Ellison in 1810. Could have been. Or more likely, he was the free person of color listed as living on William Ellison's plantation. So even in that census, there was a free person of color listed. All right. So now we got free people of color living with William Ellison. Where do they come from? If so, April still had the legal status of a slave since he was not formally manumitted until 1816. But by 1810, he may already have begun the transition from slavery to freedom, living de facto as a free man. So maybe it could have been that he actually went to be an apprentice in 1790. Is that what they're saying? He became a slave or was born? And he didn't finish his apprenticeship till 1816? Or what's going on here? We got to try to make sense out of all this, right? Because it seems like that's his son. And that he sent him to get a skill, a trade. He sent his son to be very successful. He prepared him for life to be very successful. That's what I'm getting from this. More direct evidence that April's father was either Robert or William Ellison is the exceptional treatment he received while still a slave. Rather than sending the mulatto boy out to the fields with the other slaves, listen to what they're telling you. He never worked the fields. It's either Robert or William's son. April, right? So-called April. It's one of their sins. He was never treated like a slave, even though they're saying they still keep calling him a slave here. Rather than sending the mulatto boy to the fields with the other slaves, his master apprenticed him to a trade. Like I was just saying, he was sent to get prepared to carry on the name. The apprenticeship probably began about 1802. Probably, again, probably when April was 12 which makes it impossible to surmise whether the decision was made by William or his father. But the most telling evidence for the paternity of one of the white Ellisons is that William Ellison eventually freed April. There is no indication that Ellison ever manumitted any other slave, but there is good evidence that something more than April's craft, color, and talent made him special in his master's eyes. William Ellison owned another artisan, a cabinet maker named Julius, whom he sold in Charleston in 1813 for $800. Charleston, remember, Charleston was a free people of colored city. We already got all this in past videos. Let's not forget about all this. 
The handsome prize Julius Commander suggests he was a man of considerable talent and makes clear Ellison did not free all his skilled slaves, nor since Julius was a mulatto did Ellison free all his mulatto slaves. Instead, for some reason, Ellison singled out April for manumission. He may well have had several motives for freeing April, but probably an important one was that April was his half-brother or his son. His half-brother or his son. His son. His half-brother or his son. This is the main source for William Ellison's life. This is what I've been trying to show you guys, right? We got to verify all the sources and everything. What are they really telling us? It's all conjecture. He doesn't really know, but he's letting you know it has to be his family. It has to be. All right, so again, William, so-called April Ellison, his wife Matilda right here. We still got to get her parents. We're going to dig into that. So again, they have his father listed here as William Harrison Ellison. Now, they're saying he was 17, but if he was born in 1775, as they were saying, that would make him 15. So he was born at least 1773, supposedly, if he was born in 1790. So even that doesn't make sense. It's what I'm letting you know. So they're going off the tombstone of William Ellison. They have 1790 there as a birth date again. And William Ellison, again, his, either his half-brother or father, is the son of Robert Ellison and Elizabeth Potts. Robert Ellison, actually Captain Robert Emmett Ellison, Captain Robert Ellison. He was in the Revolutionary War. Here he is in the 1790 census. All right, Robert Ellison is what they were showing us earlier. He's got some good stories. All right, it says Robert Ellison. This is what I want to show you right here. Let me go over here. This is from another person's tree. This is something that was recorded. All right, it says Robert Ellison from the country of Antrim in Ireland. So the Ellisons come from Ireland. All right, are these black Irish? We already know there was a lot, hundreds of thousands of black Irish coming over here. All right, I know Top Cat's been uh, showing you that. I've shown you that a lot of times as well. We're gonna keep showing you that. I'm gonna, I got a lot more correlation of this. Again, so he was uh, from Ireland. All right, 1742. He uh, married 1772 Elizabeth Potts. So she was also born in Ireland in about 1750. They're both buried at the Ellison Homestead Cemetery, it says. And their kids, all right, they say William Ellison right here, 1775. William Ellison, supposed dad of April or the half brother, or another strong possibility is that might be the same person. Because we got a census again from 1850 showing a William H. Ellison being 80 years old in 1850. That almost matches the years he was born in. William Ellison. And he's not supposed to be alive in 1850. He, remember, he died in 1833. All right. I stated in Chapter 4, Robert Ellison got an English education in Pennsylvania and became a deputy surveyor when he came to South Carolina. After the death of his parents, his name is found on the land plats and a set of survey instruments is listed among his possessions at his death. There are many pre-revolutionary grants of land recorded for Robert Ellison. All right. He had a lot of grants of land. Why? The earliest date found on these lands transactions was November 1st, 1767. The survey date mentioned in Chapter 4. This was for 150 acres on the spring of Little River and was surrounded by vacant land. It was probably the original homestead site. On December 2nd, 1772, just after his marriage to Elizabeth Potts, 400 acres were surveyed for him on Watts Branch of Jackson's Creek. In his will, he states that he lives on the head branches of Jackson's Creek. The old homestead cemetery can be found in a wooden spot off the highway going from Winsboro to Newberry. And uh, Robert's wife is Elizabeth Potts, it says here, is said by tradition to have been the daughter of Thomas Potts of Charles Charleston, but there's no evidence to support this, although the marriage did occur in Charleston. John Bailey Edgar tells a meeting of a descendant of his sister of Elizabeth Potts, who remained in Ireland. And he said that all of the family, except this married sister, came to South Carolina directly from Ireland. So they're also Irish, the Potts side. Robert Ellison is Irish. So that William Ellison, his opposed dad is complete Irish. All right, that would make him Irish. That would make William Ellison Irish. Irish, all right? very almost full-blooded Irish all right because the conjecture about his mom we don't know all that that's all conjecture right the Ellison family came to the Carolina country by way of Ireland all right in Pennsylvania originally English the Ellison's moved across the Irish Sea in the 17th century 
settling in the northernmost county of Ireland, County Antrim. There in 1742, Robert Ellison had been born. Two years later, his father, his mother, his sister, and his four brothers moved to Pennsylvania, where Robert grew up. After the death of his parents in 1761, Robert and the other Ellison children moved to Fairfield District, South Carolina. All right, again, so it's all matching the tree that I got. Again, Robert Ellison, Elizabeth Potts, all right? Now, it says here, about 1802, April's master apprenticed him to William McCray, his master. Oh, I thought that was his dad. Remember, he, the same author said is either his brother, right, or his dad. So now he's calling him his master. So it says his master apprenticed him to William McCray, the young white Winsboro gin maker who traveled up country with James Edgar. The McCray family settled in Fairfield about the same time as the Ellisons, and David McCray served in Robert Ellison's company during the Revolutionary War. So he was actually under Robert Ellison, Captain Robert Ellison. He was under Robert Ellison. So maybe he respected Robert, right? These are like a family friend. These are like families that know each other, the McCrates and the Ellisons, right? Remember, McCrate is where they sent April to get taught. This was a family, basically friend. He served under Robert Ellison's company during the Revolutionary War. So they knew each other. April worked in McCrae's gin shop until 1816, growing to manhood between the carpenter's bench and the blacksmith's forge. He was fortunate to have an apprenticeship, and he was doubly fortunate to be apprenticed to McCrae, all right? So he was very fortunate, this April. This slave was being treated more like a son. Training in any trade set him apart from most slaves who were consigned to grub their lives away with thick-handled hoes. Few slaves had the chance to work with well wrought tools in artisan shops. Even those lucky enough to be trained in a craft usually received only rudimentary apprenticeships. Relatively brief periods of instruction designed to prepare them as rough plantation carpenters, blacksmiths, or masons. April, in contrast, spent as many as 14 years under the tutelage of a master craftsman, learning year by year the ways of a complex trade. Jing making required expertise as a carpenter, a blacksmith, and a machinist, plus the rare ability to integrate the three crafts. April's apprenticeship began his development into a master gin maker. They prepared him for life. Again, so we continue in the book, Black Masters, a free family of color in the Old South. And it says here, you know, after he was freed, it says by 1820, or after he was supposedly a freed man or had his money, his own business, so by 1820, Ellison, William Ellison, had somehow managed to buy two adult male slaves between the ages of 26 and 45, who could be put to work at once. April's transition from slave to master, from slave to slaveholder, was nearly immediate. It was immediate. Almost from the beginning, he built the economic foundation of his freedom on slave labor. All right, so he got, so it's ironic that he, was freed, you know, he was a slave himself, supposedly, right? And he wanted to get rid of his slave stigma and change his name, right? But he didn't care about being a successful guy off the backs of other people or slave labor. No more than four years after he achieved his freedom, April demonstrated that he did not blink at perpetuating a status he detested for himself and his family. He didn't care about doing it to others if he began to purchase the slaves soon after he arrived in Statesburg buying them on credit and paying off the debt as he prospered. Then he bought slaves at the same time he bought his wife and daughter out of slavery. He bought his wife and daughter out of slavery by showing that he did not hesitate to own, use, and exploit slave labor. He demonstrated to local whites that although he was a Negro, although he had only recently been a slave himself, he was no more anti slavery than they were. All right, so again, conjecture with the whites. What whites? We saw all his neighbors were people of color. For the same year, April moved to Statesburg. Inhabitants of Camden, 20 miles to the north, uncovered extensive plans for a slave insurrection. April Ellison lived a wrench in irony. Having struggled to rescue his family from slavery, he was willing to extend that status to other so-called Afro-Americans or other people of color. He didn't care. At the age of 30, Ellison was a master gin maker, master of himself, and now a slave master. In four short years, April Ellison, free man of color, had achieved more worldly success than most white people in the South accomplished in a lifetime. All of a sudden, this guy just came out of nowhere and got more successful than any of them ever accomplished in a lifetime. 
Does that all make sense to you? He had established himself in the gin trade in the midst of the Piedmont cotton boom. You gotta understand, this was the biggest cotton plantation owner. All right, all those stories about the, the, the horrors of the cotton fields and people picking cotton and getting, you know, treated bad. This was him. This He was the biggest. He was the biggest there. Right? Right in the midst of the Piedmont cotton boom. And he wrote King Cotton just as surely as did the planters. Bold by his attainment and ambitious for more, he petitioned the court in 1820 for a new name. Successful, he was now ready to test the outer limits of white to toleration as William Ellison. All right, so all of a sudden, he's William Ellison. He decided to move from his current status as a mechanic who maintained another man's gin to that of a full-fledged independent artisan, constructing, selling, and servicing Ellison gins. And we continue in the book, Black Masters, A Free Family of Color in the Old South. This is from chapter two, it's labeled Freedom Bound. And right here in the second paragraph, it says, For almost two centuries before the Ellison was born, free Negroes lived in North America. All right, listen to what they're telling you. So if he was born in 1790, they're telling you that since 1590, 200 years, two centuries, there was already free Negroes living in North America since 1590. You hear what they're telling you? They accompanied the early European explorations as adventurers, sailors, and settlers. They were actually settlers. Who? Free Negroes. They were what? Adventurers. They were the pirates. They were the shipbuilders. They were the sailors, the captains, and settlers, the colonists. You hear? This is correlation to what we've been learning. They accompanied. You were already here for 200 years. Even free, ne even European ne free Negroes. Yes, they accompanied from where? They didn't come from Africa. They didn't tell you. That's conjecture. They accompanied the early European explorations. The early Europeans, they were adventurous sailors and settlers. Among the indentured servants who served out their terms in the tobacco fields of Chesapeake Bay region in the 17th century were Negroes. All right. It was also Negroes as indentured servants who light their white counterparts just like the white Europeans who came as indentured servants in the tobacco fields became land-owning farmers and participants in the local affairs of society. Again, do you understand what they're telling you here? There was so-called black Europeans coming and working. Black Europeans as indentured servants along with their pale-skinned brethren from Europe, right? And they would what? get their freedom dues after they complete their service, their indentured servitude, right? And then they became what? Land-owning farmers and participating in the local affairs of society, becoming slaveholders, right? Plantation owners too. Who? Free Negroes. 200 years before 1790, they're letting you know, all right? Just to correlate right here on Ancestry.com, it says William Holmes April, Ellison II. Just want to read this part uh, down here. And it says... That when war, the war between the states broke out in 1861, William Ellison Jr., again, Jr., his dad, William Ellison, right, was one of the staunchest supporters of the Confederacy. His grandson joined a Confederate artillery unit, and William turned his plantation over from cotton cash crop production to farming foodstuff for the Confederacy. William Ellison Jr. died on 5th December 1861, at the age of 71. And per his wishes, his family continued to actively support the Confederacy throughout the war. Aside from producing corn fodder, bacon, corn shucks, and cotton for the Confederate Army, they contributed vast amounts of money, paid 5000 in taxes, and invested a good portion of their fortune into Confederate bonds, which were worthless at the end of war. You can find all this info in that book we just read from. William Anderson Jr. had died within a state of praise at 43,500, consisting of 70 slaves. His will stated that his estate should pass into the joint hands of his daughter and his two surviving sons. He bequeathed $500 to a slave daughter he had sold. At his death, he was one in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in all South Carolina, was in the top 5% of land ownership, and he was the third largest slave owner in the entire state. All right, All right before we uh, finish again, this is the uh, weekly challenger.com uh, website. It says top 10 black slave owners. All right, so we're going to go to the part that correlates to our video uh, today because it talks about different ones we're going to get into in the future videos. Again, April, William April Ellison. This is a picture from Alcatron. This is not specifically William, I don't think. 
uh, but it might be. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really say the source of the picture when you go to Alcatron, but it says here, correlation. It says 1862, William Ellison was one of the largest slave owners in South Carolina, as well as one of the wealthiest. He was born a slave and was given the name April after months in which he was born. He was luckier than most and was bought by a white slave owner named William S. who took the time to educate him. He took the time to educate him. We already know how to dodge the hijack. What makes Edison so despicable and earns him the number two spot on this list. The number two spot on this list is how he collected his wealth. Ellison was known to have made a large proportion of his money as a slave breeder. All right, I didn't get into all the bad things, all the history, because I didn't want to do this to just make him look bad. But yes, there's a lot of bad stories about him and how he treated his slaves really bad and how he was breeding slaves. Breeding slaves was illegal in many southern states, but Ellison secretly sold almost all females born, keeping a select few for future breeding. He kept many of the young males as they were considered useful on his plantation. Ellison was known to be a harsh master, and his slaves were almost starved and extremely poorly clothed. He kept a widowless building on his property for the specific purpose of chaining his misbehaving slaves. All right, William Ellison, black on black war, right? More and more. All right, we're in this other website, slaverebellion.info. All right, it says here the Slave Rebellion website, and they're talking about the black slave owners. So it says here, William Ellison, April, right? His whole story again. He was emancipated, blah, blah, blah. Now it says right here, to William Ellison, slaves were a source of labor. This ideology helps to explain why there was a racial male to female of four to one in the 1860s. The male slaves were a direct source of income. The females were future benefits. Assuming that the women produced children at a ratio of one boy to one girl, the best explanation for a shortage of girls is that they were sold as slaves. The average price for a slave girl was $400, and selling 20 girls would add additional $8,000 cash, which would contribute to the land and slave purchase. This silent tradition around Stateburg was not questioned, but his reputation as a harsh master, his reputation, look, another source, was talked about. His slaves were said to be the district's worst fed and clothes. Ellison and his family lived frugally. He was even more tight-fisted about providing food, clothes, and housing for his slaves. His harsh treatment may have come from the fact that his slaves were very bitter because the men and women had seen their daughters sold away into slavery. Also, the harsh treatment could have been from Ellison's need to prove to the whites that he was not soft on slaves because of his color. Sometimes his slaves ran away, and on the least one occasion he hired a slave catcher. He never skipped on a medical care for his slaves, but he did not care to help their spiritual needs. Through all the years, William Ellison may have been harsh on his slaves, but the money they produced helped keep his family well-to-do up until the Civil War. In 1829, he purchased two more male slaves between the ages 12 and 24. Early in the 1830s, Ellison started using his sons as gin makers, but there was still more work than the men could handle. At the end of the decade, Ellison now owned 36 slaves. 30 were males and six females who mostly worked the fields and produced children, bred slaves for him. The census at this time had Ellison with 14 slaves. At his ownership of slaves grew, so did his land, buying over 350 acres in that 10 year span. By his 50th birthday in 1840, William had reached a plateau that few whites, let alone blacks, had ever reached in the early 1840s his sons and daughters married mulattoes from charleston and came to live on the ellison plantation his sons became slave owners with the help of their father the slaves were from the ellison family and were just passed down to the next generation these slaves were not income producing slaves but rather house servants by 1860 ellison increased his slave population from 36 in 1850 to 30 to 63 an increase of 75 percent that year in the census, he reported that his total worth was just over $61,000, which was very low for the property and personal slaves that he owned. The man who started out life as a slave achieved financial success. His wealth was 90% greater than his white neighbors in Sumter District. In the entire state, only 5% owned as much real estate as Ellison. His wealth was 15 times greater than that of the state's average for whites, and Ellison owned more than 99% of the South's slaveholders. He never achieved a monopoly in slavery, but was the highest producing slave owner in the county. Without slaves, Ellison could never have gotten past the income of a tradesman. With the slaves, he accomplished the security of no other. Although a successful slave owner and cotton farmer, Ellison's major source of income came from slave breeding. 
All right. Throughout the South, slave breeding was looked down on with disgust. He began slave breeding in 1840. Females were not productive workers in his fa factory or cotton fields, so he only kept a few women for breeders and sold most of his females. He had the reputation of being a harsh master. His slaves were the worst fed and clothes. He maintained on his property a wind windowless building where he chained his problem slaves. His slaves were listed among the runaways because of his harsh treatment. Having started life out as a slave did not make him sensitive to their needs because he saw his slaves as no more than property. And again, was he really a slave? He's being apprenticed. Remember, he didn't never work the field, so he doesn't know what it's like. On one occasion, Ellison hired the service of a slave catcher, according to an account by Robert N. Andrews, a white man who had purchased a small hotel in Stabrook and in the 1820s hunted down one of his valuable slaves in Belleville, Virginia. He stated, I was paid $77 returning the slave and $74 for expensive. All right, so again, they per they're telling you here that during the Civil War, the Ellison family actively participated and supported the Confederacy throughout the war. All right, so again, that's a future video. A lot of the Confederates were so-called black people. A lot of the Republicans were so-called black people. All right. They lied to us about the percentages. They lied to us about how many black slave owners there were. And they're lying to us about all these people who are they calling white. A lot of them are not white. All right. We're going to start finding this out as the years go by. I'm not just from me. You guys are going to see. All right. It's overwhelming. I can make so many videos like this to start picking out all these people. And do their genealogy so you can see how it just doesn't make sense when they're explaining our story and when we actually look at the records. Oh, hello. All right, so before we finish, I want to read this article here from the Tampa Bay Times, an archive written in 2005 by Tim Grant. It says, Dr. Ellison's family, secret is free at last. The secret is free at last. And at the end of times, the books will be unsealed. The truth will be revealed, right? Says people here know Dr. Henry S. Ellison III as the given doctor. He was volunteered for so many boards, done so much to help so many people. They sometimes wonder how he found time for doctoring. The first black doctor in Junkstown, black people admire him for opening doors and so many others. What none of them know is Dr. Ellison's secret. Something he kept to himself, something he did not want to be identified with. But now at age 71, with lung cancer spread into his brain, Dr. Ellison says it's time. Time to talk about his great-grandfather. The slave owner. William Ellison is believed to have been the wealthiest black slave master in the antebellum South. Wealthiest. Owning more slaves than all but the richest white planters. Memoirs from time suggest he did not treat his slaves well. All right. The stories, all the accounts written from those times, he didn't treat his slaves well. William Ellison's slaves were said to be the most overworked underfed and ill-clothed in the district, all right, Tampa Bay Times. No, this is not something Dr. Ellison has wanted to talk about. A time and a place. Growing up in North Carolina during the Great Depression, Dr. Ellison wondered why his family's lifestyle was better than other black families in Greensboro. Why are we so rich? But his questions about his family went unanswered. My mother used to protect me from that since I was the youngest, he said. As he grew older, he learned that several members of his family made money buying and selling other black people, using them as slaves. This came into my life about the time civil rights came about. And I know nobody would be wanting to brag about blacks owning other blacks, he said. About the time I found out was when everybody was looking into their heritage and how blacks had been mistreated. You know where I found out most of my family's history, he said? When I got married, my mother told my wife. My father never talked at all about his family. If it was up to him, I would have never have even known I was born. He does not conceal his resentment that so much about his great-grandfather was kept secret from him. Had he known about his great-grandfather earlier, he had might have modeled his life after him. By the time I found out everything, I was a man and my life's pattern was already set. Ellison's 70-year-old wife, Etina, also has his own forced him to close his obstetrics practice five years ago. This day, he said he's in the worst pain he's felt in weeks, but he doesn't cancel his appointment with a reporter. It's important to get this out. The main thing I'd like for people to know is you can't take something that happened years ago and equate it to what's happening now, he said, all right? All right, it's not your fault what happened in the past, all right? You have to take everything according to the time in which it was done. The whites were doing the same thing. All right. The whites were doing it. The blacks could do it too, I guess. Right. That's what he's saying. Anytime my great grandfather 
may have done. He did because he conformed to the ways and norms of that particular era. He was probably a pretty nice individual, probably. Continuing says that at the continuing further down says at the start of the Civil War, William Ellison owned 63 slaves and an 800 acre plantation. He hired slave catchers to hunt down those who ran away. He had slave catchers. He even sold his slaves female children, apparently because they were no use to his cotton gin business. He didn't care. He was cruel, separating families. All right, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Remember, these are Irish, most likely black Irish. He died in 1861, but his descendants continued to live in the house in Statesburg, South Carolina until 1923. Twelve years after the house was sold, three little girls playing outside stumbled across a wooden crate hidden beneath the porch. Inside was a collection of molded letters written by Ellison family members. The letters talked of politics, gossip, and of course, the management of the family's slaves. Descendants of this family had guarded their past and one by one carried it to their graves. But now, thanks to the letters, the secret was out. In a tough spot, two historians used the Ellison family letters as a basis for a book called Black Masters. I right, the book we just read. James Rourke of Emory University and Michael Johnson of Johns Hopkins University used the letters to reconstruct the family history. During the early 1980s, the historians had tracked down one surviving member of the Ellison family, a doctor who lived in Johnstown, Ohio. I talked to the receptionist in his office on several occasions, but the doctor would never respond, Rourke said. Family history is always dangerous business. We were poking around in people's private lives, and there are some things people don't want told. We encountered a great deal of sensitivity. This family is complex because of their history. Is William Ellison a man to be celebrated or ashamed of? It's an amazing story of achievement under the most difficult circumstances, but then he knew what slavery was all about and he was willing to implicate others. Some would say his crime is greater than that of the whites. Mm, that's deep right there. I, I didn't say it. The Ellisons were hardly the only black masters in the antebellum South. They were hardly, they weren't the only ones. Census records in 1860 showed there were 122 free blacks in Charleston who owned slaves. Remember, Charleston was a free people of color city. We've gotten this in the past videos. We know South Carolina is a huge hug and nut um, landing spot. We know what happened in South Carolina where most of the Indian slaves were exported and any other slave exported out of the United States during that time. All right, in South Carolina, who was going there and doing that? Most of them owned only one or two slaves. None owned as many as William Ellison. Black Masters was published 10 years ago. Johnson said even today, most people don't realize black people own black people. Even today in 2020, you hearing this right now, a lot of you, I didn't know. A lot of you, that's not true. You're making all this up. For whites in contemporary society, the notion of black masters is a message of relief because now we know that whites weren't the only ones, Johnson said. It removes a little of the sense of guilt. So Johnson wanted to prove there was black owners. That's why the only reason he did it. You see, so he can blame, uh, so he can put the blame on others as well. So he felt a little better. History puts humans in tough spots, and William Ellison was in a very tough spot. It's easier for us to judge him than be in his shoes. He had a lot of admirable qualities. All right, further down, and said, It's no surprise he didn't know Dr. Ellison's past, somebody that knew him. In more than 40 years in Junkstown, Dr. Ellison said he only told one person his secret, his oldest and closest friend, who is now dead. He says he wasn't afraid it would ruin his practice or his image. It was just something he didn't want to be identified with. All right. Yes, he was afraid of his reputation. Years ago, Dr. Ellison changed his given middle name from Shrewsbury to Stephen. After he changed his name, he discovered he had unwittingly severed his link with his ancestors. All the Ellison men bore the middle name Shrewsbury. His son, Henry Stephen Ellison, the fourth 32, is adopted, as are his two daughters, Pond 33 and Alicia 27. Dr. Ellison's death will end the Ellison family bloodline. I think my great-grandfather did very well for the time he lived, Dr. Ellison said. But if he lived now and had the same attitude he had then, he'd be called an Uncle Tom. He'd be called an Uncle Tom. This is from his descendant, all right? If, if you just look at it, he was an Uncle Tom. But he had to do what he did to survive because he lived in South Carolina and he ran a gin mill. And everybody he dealt with was white. All right, so this is all assumptions. See, this is going off the so african slavery and that all europeans were white see this is all assumptions i don't think he knew how deep the rabbit hole was then the hundreds of thousands of black europeans that came over 
All right, so I just want to read this from the Tampa Bay Times so you can know the truth. This is from Descendant himself letting you know, hey, man, he'd be called Uncle Tom today. But, hey, he had to do what he had to do, right? He had to be successful no matter what. So, again, all skin folk ain't king folk. 